shall we start this uh, after lunch session with uh, Barbara Amaral from uh, Instituto de Física from University of São Paulo. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to start uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me and also apologizing for not being able to be here the entire week, but it's getting, it's getting too uncomfortable to sit all day. These chairs don't help, but if in case you want to talk uh, a, a little more, I'm always available. Okay, so what I come from the field of foundations of quantum uh, theory, uh, intersection with quantum information, and what I want to talk to you is about uh, different definitions of non-classicality that we explore in our field and maybe how this can help with the question of this uh, event that how we prove that or how we test non-classical features of gravity. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to talk is, I, I chose two different notions, there are more, but I think these are the most important ones, non-locality and contextuality. I'll talk, I'll, I'll define both of them precisely, and I'll uh, try to answer the question of why do we care about these things, and how can they help us in study non-classical features of many different things, then I'll mention briefly how, uh, what do we ex expect uh, that these things would help in gravity experiments, and I'll end with some uh, final remarks. Okay, um, so the question that I want to attack here in this uh, talk uh, is what do I have to see to say that something is classical or what do I have to see to say that something is quantum? Or more generally, what do I have to see to say that something is non-classical? The answer to these questions depend on the problem that you're dealing with, and here I want to address two uh, ans possible answers to these questions that might be of interest to gravity experiments. So the first that I want to address here is non-locality. Uh, it's something that is already um, important for the field. And the idea here uh, to answer the question of what is classical, what is not classical, what is non-classical, uh, the strategy that we use here is to translate uh, the intuitive notion of a classical world into a uh, reasonable mathematical uh, hypothesis that I'll explain a little bit uh, later. Then, with this mathematical uh, structure, we will derive conditions that must be satisfied by theories adhering to this hypothesis, and then given some uh, theory, some experiment, some model, I can test if this uh, experiment, model, whatever, um, ob obeys these restrictions that I derived. And if not, if these restrictions are violated, I know that that definition of classicality does not apply to my experiment theory or whatever. Okay, so in this, um, in this notion of non-classicality that we call non-locality or Bell non-locality, uh, we have uh, what we call a Bell scenario. I have at least a bipartite system, and one of the parts of the system is with Bob, and the other part is with Alice. They are far apart from each other, so there is special, a spatial separation between them. And uh, I will treat these systems as what we call black boxes, so they are some physical systems inside my box, but I don't care about the details of this system. So I just uh, care about inputs, different measurements that I can make, and outputs, outcomes for these different measurements. And then I'll just compute the probabilities. So here I'm, um, I'm using the most abstract way of 
studying our physical systems. I'm just looking at the statistics of these measurements. So, of course, there is a state, a measurement, there is some uh, physical, uh, real physical systems or imaginary system inside that with uh, proper uh, state and measurements that in my theory will explain the probabilities, but I don't care about these details. I only care about the probabilities. And here this, this notation means that Alice will measure X, Bob will measure Y, and they will uh, obtain, Alice obtains A for measurement X and B for measurement Y as outcomes. Okay, so I will consider this type of experiment, uh, recalling that there is special separation here. So uh, Bob has no information about X or A. So the hypothesis that I'm going to make here as my notion of classicality, first is what we call realism, and here we must be careful because this word is used for several different things in the, the field of foundation. So what I mean by realism is something very specific, is the fact that the measurements that I'm making, they, are, they have predefined values that are only revealed by the measurement. So this is what I mean by realism. Then I have the assumption of locality, which is implied by this special separation. So Alice's choice should not influence Bob's result and vice versa. So there's no communication between them uh, after the experiment is started, has started. And something that we call free will, Alice and Bob, they can freely choose the experiments they will perform and I'll mention exactly what this means uh, later. Okay, for some of you that might have heard, this is what we call a hidden variable model for quantum theory or for the theory that I'm um, trying to explain classically. Okay, so these are my uh, hypotheses and now I'll translate this hypothesis into some mathematical restriction. So, um, the fact that I am um, dealing with the, the restriction of realism implies that if I measure X, I have the, the, a definite outcome for that. Maybe I don't know exactly, I have to use probabilities because I don't know all the details of the experiment, but uh, there is some variable that I'll call lambda. If I knew that variable, then I would know for sure the value of measurement X. And the same thing for Y, for Bob. And locality here means this product here, that uh, this probability does not depend on Y and B and vice versa. So here I used realism and locality. And of course, um, since I don't know lambda, maybe I have to make a convex uh, combination of these instances, so I sum over all possibilities here. And here, the, the free will condition is not that, uh, that obvious as the other ones, but it's just the fact that uh, a, uh, x does not depend on lambda. These are... Um, independent variables. So here I can uh, sum just over uh, this probability of the lambdas without no dependence with X and Y. So I use the three, um, the three hypotheses here, and hence if I have some theory satisfying these three hypotheses, uh, my probability has to satisfy this. And this, has, this implies a lot of restrictions that we can test. Uh, so if I have um, the statistics of an experiment, I can test if this thing holds or not. So I can say if, it, if that experiment can be explained with this kind of theory. Okay, so this is what we call uh, local distributions and is the definition 
of classicality when we talk about these Bell scenarios. Okay, uh, now I want to generalize this a little bit. So I want to remove the restriction of spatial uh, separation between these things. This has a cost, as I will uh, explain later. But now I will uh, change the kind of um, problem that I'll deal with, although things are still very similar as you will see. So now I will remove these restrictions of bipartite systems. I'm looking only to a single system, but I'll focus also on the sets of measurement that I'm performing on the systems. So depending on the kind of measurement that you make, for example, in a quantum system, uh, the structure of the set of measurements, of the restrictions that you have inside that set of measurement, uh, implies that it is impossible to explain that experiment or that theory with reasonable classical hypothesis. So again, I'll try to translate this idea of classicality into a set of hypotheses, then I'll derive um, conditions that must be satisfied and then we check, we can check if my experiment satisfies them or not. Okay, so again the hypothesis, the first one continues to be the same. I have uh, realism in this sense that I'm considering here. Measurement only review predefined results. This is kind of a basic thing in every definition of classicality that we deal with. Now I'll replace the notion of locality, which does not play, play a role anymore since I don't have bipartite systems any, anymore. I only have a single system. But now I, I'll consider a set of um, measurements that I can make. Some of them, these measurements can be um, performed jointly. Some of these measurements cannot be performed jointly. What this means in an experiment is a very, very hard question. I can comment on this later, but, um, well, I'm almost a mathematician, so you can just write in a piece of paper if that measurement uh, can be performed with another one or not. But the, this is something tricky when you go to real life. And the non-contextuality hypothesis means that the value assigned to some measurement does not depend on which set of other measurements I can perform jointly with them. So this makes sense if the measurement is only, only revealing a predefined uh, value. So it cannot depend on other things that you decide to measure together with it. And free will still uh, remains the same. Okay, now we do the same thing. We translate the, these hypotheses into a mathematical condition. And uh, what is known as the bell koch specker theorem is the result showing that there's no theory satisfying conditions one, two, and three that is consistent with the predictions of quantum physics. So this was, um, this result was derived um, 50, 60 years ago by Koch and Specker. But for them, the non-contextuality hypothesis was so natural that they didn't even talk about it. Uh, um, they just assumed it. And then Bell was the one to, to see that if you remove that thing, then you could uh, find uh, theories that would be consistent with the predictions of quantum physics. Okay, so now my scenario consists of a single system and a set of measurements that I can make and a subset of these measurements. This subset tells me, tells me the measurements that are compatible in the language of quantum physics, but not necessarily I'm talking about a quantum system, uh, which are the contexts. Um, and this context are exactly the subsets of variables or of measurements uh, for which I know from the experiment uh, the joint probability distributions because I can measure them jointly for some reason. 
Okay, again, uh, what does this imply? So suppose that we can uh, measure together two observables, x and y. And I may use probabilities because I don't know enough about the details of the experiment, but in principle I can find um, some hidden state that I called lambda, such a way that if I know this lambda, then I know uh, for sure which is the value of measurement x. And the same for the measurement y. Here I'm using the realism hypothesis and also the non-contextuality hypothesis because I'm uh, supposing that these probabilities here do not depend on y and b and vice versa. So it does not depend on the other thing that I'm measuring together. And then because I don't know which is lambda, then I have to make a convex combination over all lambdas. So you see there is very similar mathematically, but the physical meaning of these things is a bit different. So um, Bell scenarios are a particular case of these um, contextuality scenarios in which the context are formed by one measurement on each side. But here it can be more general because I don't need this spatial separation. Okay, so again, uh, this is a mathematical condition that we can test. So you give me the data from ex an experiment, I can tell you if it satisfied this condition or not. Okay, so in general, what do we have? Uh, we have this set here. Uh, this is just a very simple representation. These things live in a very, very huge uh, high dimensional space and they're super complicated. But the main message he uh, here is the following. We have the classical set is a polytope and we have the set of all probabilities that have uh, meaning. It's very uh, big, much bigger than the classical set. Classical in the sense of pick your favorite, non-locality or contextuality. The quantum set lies in between in general and it's very, very hard to characterize and generally is not a polytope. And you have this, um, uh, this space here between quantum theory and all the things that make sense mathematically. And then you can ask why this is different from this, why this is different from this, and you can explore the theories and try to answer several questions in foundations of physics exploring where in these polytopes you are. So it's very rich mathematically and physically. Okay, so now that I told you the definitions, I'll tell you a little bit why do we care about these things and why I chose these two and which one might be the best to test in gravity experiments, which is your interest. So first, um, one of the things that we like about these things is that since we are performing, we are defining these in a very abstract way, I don't need necessarily to talk about states and measurements or a physical system, a specific model. So I can use these definitions to um, reframe the results in quantum information, for example, in what people call device independent approach. So I don't need to guarantee or to um, go and test every single detail of my device. For example, my uh, random number generation or something like this. If the statistics satisfy certain conditions, for example, if, if it violates some inequality, whatever, then I can guarantee you several things. And this is interesting, especially, for example, in cryptography and in many other applications in quantum information. It's theory independent, so I can use it to test other things, crazy theories, I invent some theory outside quantum theory, some uh, other stuff, 
I can test if it, what kind of non-classicality this crazy theory that I invented has. But just looking at the set of probability that I generate with that new theory. So I can see if it lies uh, outside quantum theory, I can compare things, and this is interesting. Um, and one thing that I already mentioned, this is very, very, very nice for the certification of states and measurements, which is something very important for quantum information. So for example, there are some inequalities that I can derive with that locality condition, for example. And if I see certain violations of that inequality, I can guarantee to you that I have certain type of entanglement or that I have a certain type of measurement. And this is very powerful. It's the most powerful type of certification that we have, which is of extreme uh, applications in, in quantum information, especially in cryptography. Okay, and why do I chose this tool? And let me just go on to uh, advantages and drawbacks from each one of them. So I chose these two because they are the most famous ones and are generally the kind of thing that we have in our experiments. And um, why people prefer non-locality over contextuality? I don't know if you are aware of this huge debate, but some people uh, that work on non-locality, they, they simply hate the notion of contextuality because they say it says nothing about nothing. And there is a reason to it because uh, when you go to foundations, what you want is to test these hidden variables. That, that was the motivation for the definition of all these things. And basically you want to say that your experiment cannot be simulated by a classical theory. And in no locality, there is a much more powerful physical reason to say that it cannot. Because if in your experiment, all the assumptions of a Bell scenario are obeyed, then to reproduce that statistics with classical theory, you have to have faster than light communication. So it's very powerful. Having all those conditions satisfied is not, it's not easy. That's why the loophole-free experiments only came in 2015. But if everything goes as planned, you have this powerful way of saying that it cannot be explained by classical theories. On the other hand, simulating contextuality requires memory. And you're dealing with a single system. Why can it not have this memory available for simulation? So you don't have that powerful uh, reason to say that you don't have a classical simulation for that experiment. Sometimes this memory required is uh, much larger than the information cap uh, carrying capacity of the system itself, but it's still not as strong as the, the one for non-locality. So there is this uh, drawback, and, but in some experiments you have uh, very good reasons not to have this memory, uh, but it's uh, experiment dependent and is not as strong as the first one. Okay, on the other hand, non-locality requires multipartite, partially separated system, so the Spatial separation has to be big enough for the information about the choices of the measurements and outcomes not to travel from one place to the other uh, when this, these choices are made. This is not expected to hold in gravity experiments. And contextuality allows for much more possibilities, especially because you can have these non-classicalities in in basically any type of state. You can have your state can be the, the identity. You can think about measurements with the structure such that you still have these non-classicalities being um, 
appearing in your experiment. So there is this advantage. And of course, um, when you think about quantum features, the first thing that comes to your mind is entanglement and superposition, entanglement as a consequence. And of course, that's what you want to prove, that you have entanglement, something like this. But uh, non-locality is a consequence of entanglement. So if you have non-locality, you are um, proving that you have entanglement on your system. So of course, um, non-locality in, in the sense of uh, non-classicality or in a, in a sense of proving that you have entanglement, entanglement certification might be very important, but I don't think that the community should be looking for a loophole-free experiment of Bell non-locality with uh, this type of systems because it's very unlikely that this will hold. So maybe um, contextuality will be the best uh, choice. Okay, um, the question that uh, remains now is whether it is possible to make an experiment in, for example, an optomechanical system to test this kind of thing. And um, this is something that makes my presentation different because generally you're presenting things that you are already have done, and now I'll talk about something that I haven't done yet. And um, these guys are working on it. Uh, Patrick is the responsible for our group being interested in, in this kind of system. And he is the, the one that uh, is driving this in our group. Nain and Danilo, they come from the field of more related to many body systems and quantum optics, but they are, they are experts on solving the, the master equations and this kind of thing. And now they're mixing this together to try to see um, contextuality in a specific model. For now, um, we are, as I told you, more, mathematica, ma ma more mathematically oriented. So we're now focused on just demonstrating that it is feasible, not necessarily in the real experiments that can be implemented nowadays. But uh, Patrick especially is very um, determined to learn these things and, and learn the, what, what are the details of the experiments being conducted today so we can test if our model can be reproduced in some way in these experiments. So uh, I will not give you too much spoilers, so uh, this is for the future, but we basically have a, a very specific system with uh, some uh, Hamiltonian, they interact and it generates entanglement. And first we are interested in um, Local measurements, entanglement, what can we see? Again, this is a non-locality scenario, but um, as I told you, we're not very worried about loophole free of, or this kind of thing. But there, there is another interesting thing, is that we shift the non-classicality to the measurement and we can play with different things that may be interesting. Well, at least for us mathematicians, it is. Okay, conclusions. Um, we have several definitions of non-classicality available. So it depends on the kind of problem that you're dealing with. Pick your favorite or the most suitable for that. A uh, disclaimer that I should have made when I talked about contextuality. Warning, very important. The use of the word contextuality in foundations is contextual. So there are several different definitions that are called contextuality. This one is what we call Koch and Specker contextuality. They are related, but they are not uh, equivalent, so care, be careful. 
And I chose this one because I think it's the most suitable for the kind of problem that we're dealing with. Um, Non-locality unlikely to be the most suitable for gravity experiments. Maybe we should test other. That's our bet and that's what we are working on. And um, spoiler for the next episode, is it possible to test contextuality in gravity experiments? Maybe we will have that answer soon, I hope. Thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Ah. This is our group, and the people that uh, uh, give us money, and the future of this conference. She is learning both, okay, so. <laughs> okay, we have quite some time for questions. Um, so recently, um, uh, Witten, the same Witten of string theory, but he also does sort of quantum field information, among many other things, wrote this paper where he argues that um, if you have general covariance, I mean, this is in the fully relativistic limit, um, you cannot have an algebra of type 1 where you have Hamiltonians and wave functions, but you can have another algebra of type 2 where you have a density function, but it doesn't have to be pure. Does anything you said, the, is your definition of quantum mechanics in your talk an algebra of type one, or could it be an algebra of type no, two as well? Is, I mean, you didn't. This is textbook quantum mechanics. All right, so type one. But again, I have no, absolutely no idea how would you would um, apply these for this uh, type two? Because type two, I mean, type two requires a density matrix, and I think all your contextuality sort of Bell's theorems and, and will, will apply to an algebra of type two as well, because joint probabilities will be traces of products of yes. density matrixes oh, okay. and operators. So yeah, yeah, uh, you can apply uh, to that, and this is one of the advantages of this thing, because if you, the only thing that actually I need here is the possibility of computing probabilities, okay. joint probabilities. And this is like, if your theory cannot do that, then um, Can you say something more about um, how we can use memory to simulate contextuality? Okay. Let me go back to this. I should have put the references in the slides, but I made them last minute, so I don't have, but you can ask me later. Um, here. So imagine that I'm making um, um, sequential measurements, okay? Um, the most, uh, uh, the, the experiments that I know in contextuality, they are of two types. They're these ones in quantum optics, which is a single measurement, and there are some in ion traps, which are sequential measurements. So imagine that you first measure X, and then you measure Y. So you measure X, you have that uh, outcome. If your system has no memory, it will not have any way of recording what is the measurement that you make or the outcome that it, it um, that you get in that first measurement. But if you have memory, the uh, value of x and the value of um, a can be stored in your system. What is the mechanism that make the storage? I don't know. People in foundations, they are not, they're just worried uh, about it is possible to simulate or not, not exactly how the simulation is done. So you have that uh, memory, so you store X and A, and then you apply measurement Y. But since that memory is, since that information is stored in the system, this thing here could in principle depend on X and A, and that's why. But sometimes, for example, uh, most, the most simple experiment in contextuality is made with Q-treats. And sometimes, if you have a lot of 
uh, possibilities for X and A, you know by whole level theorem that you cannot store that information, that amount of information inside a Q-treat. So it, it, it would be weird if it, you had uh, that kind of mechanism uh, working on that, but <laughs> cannot rule out from start. More questions? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, very nice slides, nice talk. Um, so two distinct questions that are not really related. One of them is some people think that a way to measure the quantumness or, or characterize, I should say, the quantumness of a system is in the negativity of the Wigner function. Um, you didn't mention any of that here, no. but could you comment on that? And yes. then I'll ask question two. Yes, negativity of Wigner function. Um, of course, here contextuality, it depends on the state and measurements. So it's, it's a relation between these two things. So um, in, if you have negativity in the Wigner function, you can choose properly your measurements in such a way that you have contextuality in respect to that measurement. So negativity of the Wigner function, uh, you can witness it by contextuality experiments. Okay, so should I, this isn't my second question, it's follow up on, <laughs> on the first. So should I infer from your answer that you think this is a good way of characterizing it? I mean, not measuring, but character. Yes. Yeah, okay, you yes. agree, okay. I mean, that's my partiality as well. So the other thing is some people like to address these strange features of quantum physics via super determinism, which I personally don't care for. But when you ask, you know, can we test contextuality and gravity, do you think we could ever test super determinism? Well. Or have we already done it because we were pre debt anyway? <laughs> yeah. That's a very tricky question. Um, I'll be honest with you. I. Um, for now, we have no way of saying that we cannot rule out superdeterminism. All the predictions they have, they are compatible with the predictions of um, quantum theory, the standard formulation. And, and basically, uh, what we, let me go back here. So, you know that you cannot combine these things with uh, quantum theory. So you sh if you really want to, to uh, keep this thing here, you have to uh, g get rid of some of them. So the super determinism is getting rid of these things. And personally, I prefer getting rid of these things. If you have to accept that something is weird, I prefer like, to accept it right away. So I, I don't take these things very seriously, and I don't know much about them to like, say to you if you, what kind of experiment will be able to um, rule them out. But uh, one of my main collaborators, he was my PhD supervisor of the, I did part of my PhD in Spain, and he's one of the main uh, people in contextuality, and he is like, he is the goal of his life, to find physical difference that you can test in the lab to um, see if one of these interpretations can be ruled out. And they have a recent result, which is super nice, I might uh, send you the reference if you want, in which uh, they, uh, see, they keep this thing and they relax these two things here. And one of the things that people that uh, go for super determinism super say is that maybe you just need a little bit of dependencies on this thing. But what they show, they, they construct explicit scenarios with explicit states and measurements in which for for you to um, recover the quantum predictions, you have to go for 
full super determinant. They have to be um, completely dependent on one another. If you know lambda, you know x and y. And this shows that you cannot have just a little bit of non-contextuality or a little bit of superdeterminism in order to recover the predictions. You have to have it full. And this is weird. Like, and it goes in this direction of trying to see the physical differences of these theories. Okay. Okay, uh, so let's thank Barbara again.